Kids won't be allowed back to school Monday if they haven't been vaccinated. The district will continue door-to-door -door visits until everyone is vaccinated. One third of British nurses have said that they will not take the swine flu vaccine because they're worried about the possible side effects. How do you convince the other parents out there that we need to do this? Campbell, I'm going to get it. Yes. If that helps at all, but I'll tell you, my wife is not going to immunize our kids because I've got four of them, and when I go home, I'm not Dr. Oz, I'm Mr. Oz. This is on an independent study. Yes. Uh, Kayla, has she yes. been verified with her Tdap? No. Okay. We were coming today to give her a Tdap if she hasn't had it done yet. Get the <laughs> off my house. I think you've hit the nail on the head. This is going to be a public relations, trust your government and your health officials, public campaign. But we trusted the scientists back in 1976 mm -hmm. with the original swine flu shot. And a lot and of people got sick. And it was a debacle. Right. Not only that, some people died. Some people were paralyzed. From the shot itself. And yeah. people remember the swine flu vaccine as a terrible disaster. But this is one time. Forget the conspiracy. Listen to our government agencies. These guys are telling the truth. You know, there's no conspiracy here, folks. Just right. get your damn vaccine. Uh, hey, look on the CDC website as to what is in the swine flu vaccine. You know, aluminum, insect repellent, formaldehyde, mercury. There really is no firm evidence that vaccines do what they say they do. We have the most unhealthy generation of children in the history of mankind. Why in our great country? The vaccine known as Gardasil, about 8 million American girls have gotten the vaccine, but is it safe? But today, Merck's HPV vaccine is dealing with a growing number of reports of serious side effects. Amanda Ratner, she came down with an illness so excruciating, she had to take morphine. Her parents, both doctors, blame Gardasil. She's gone from the position of being a competitive varsity lacrosse player in high school to somebody who's chronically ill. 14-year-old Jenny developed life-threatening paralysis that's resistant to treatment. Merck and the CDC say Gardasil is safe and effective and that they've not found a link to any deaths. They also say illnesses reported after vaccinations may not have been caused by the shot. They go in for their one-year checkup with their pediatrician and they get another round of vaccines and many of them within hours, days, weeks, or months digress into autism. There's no such thing as a harmless vaccine. Autism is, in my opinion, at the far end of what's happening in terms of brain destruction from these vaccines. The idea that we can put toxins and poisons into a perfectly healthy immune system is naive at best, and it's probably quite evil. It's kind of a, a unrefined method that they use. They had to use these high levels of these adjuncts, including thimerosal. Saline, it's a, it's an antiseptic uh, preservative, and hasn't that been linked in some cases to um, autism? It, it has, and you look. It's been shown to to cause autism in children with mitochondrial dysfunction. Sanjay, there's uh, been some significant developments on the alleged link between autism and childhood vaccines. What happened to that? There are three test cases out there, Wolf, that sort of a, a special court ruled on today, trying to establish whether or not there is a link between certain vaccines, childhood vaccines, the MMR vaccine in particular, and autism. This was a ruling that a lot of people are waiting for for some time. The answer came back as no, no, no on all three of those test cases. No link was established. I looked at the signs they're relying on, and I can tell you, Joe, it is so weak. And you and I have seen, you know, in legal practice, when junk science, and we know, you know, what these phony scientists are who create this stuff. It happened in big tobacco. Right. Tobacco. It happens in and big this, oil. And this it's is, happening in global warming. And, and now it's happening in a way that's impacting is, our kids' lives. This is classic tobacco science. Even if you were to, to, to hypothesize that there is a vaccine that could be necessary, that could maybe save a life that would have otherwise died from an infectious disease, there is always a cost. In the 1980s, the autism rate in the country was 1 in 10,000. It's now 1 in 50. Looking at the safety and efficacy of these vaccines, what I found that the CDC and the FDA were telling people and the truth of the vaccines were two different things. 
It's really hard to try to find unbiased research that doesn't somehow have the drug companies associated with it. Autoimmune diseases can take months and years to manifest. Their follow-up is something like two weeks. You cannot make any firm conclusions about the safety of the vaccine. What effective really means is that a substance is injected into a body and it creates an antibody. And if an antibody response is generated by that shot, then the science says the vaccine is effective. It did what it was supposed to do. They don't actually go back and compare vaccinated versus unvaccinated. They consider that a vaccine is effective simply by measuring the antibody uh, generation. There is a leap in assumption then that simply because you have the antibody, it will protect you and keep you from getting sick. Animal models were injected with vaccines that created antibodies, and then they were introduced with the virus and still succumbed to the virus. So. We don't have real studies that say, if you have an antibody to this disease, you are then immune and you are immune for this many years. We don't have that. Because vaccination is based on the principle of immunization rather than on principle of naturally acquired immunity, what we have after vaccination is only a short lasting protection. Each of those shots have chemicals, things like aluminum, polysorbate 80, um, all kinds of toxic chemicals that are causing lots of problems in immune systems. Beyond any shadow of a doubt, aluminum adjuvants on their own can inflict autoimmune diseases. The largest, most powerful industry in the world is the pharmaceutical industry. They have fingers into foundations, fingers into major corporations, the media, they are everywhere. No American should be legally forced to play vaccine roulette with their child. We have sacrificed an entire generation of children's brains and health to build a pharmaceutical industry. You can't have it both ways. They can't be unavoidably unsafe and safe and effective at the same time. The fact that vaccines must be mandated is a sign of the failure of their program. We're playing with fire. We've got a lot of viral material we're playing with, DNA we're playing with, foreign DNA, DNA from animals, from green monkeys, from chicken eggs, all kinds of DNA that we're not eating, we're injecting. What are we creating? We don't even know. It's like Frankenscience. Do we really believe that health can only come through a vaccine? There's just no basis for saying they're safe. There's zero basis. As the number of vaccines put into a child's schedule increases in the United States, it is also being promoted in all other countries of the world. Today, we are seeing more vaccines given to more children at a younger age than ever before in history. As the number of vaccines given to children today, we have a rise in moderate to severe asthma, seizures, diabetes, and food allergies are diagnosed with autism. An alarmingly increasing rate of autoimmune diseases, mercury-based preservatives, live viruses and vaccines and other chemical agents are known culprits for neurological disorders. We must begin to honestly and objectively address what we are choosing to consume and put into our bloodstreams and ask, is it worth the risk? One of the things that women certainly are going to be concerned about is whether or not they should give their children vaccines and, and how safe are the vaccines. People who have real questions are afraid, afraid to ask about what's in it. Is it safe? When I had discussed you know, my fear that it was the vaccines that caused him to regress with our original pediatrician who had given him the MMR shot. He told me I was crazy. He told me absolutely not. They have proven one way or another that vaccines have nothing to do with autism. Um, when I told him that he had, hadn't had a normal bowel movement in a year, he said, that's toddler diarrhea. In the last 25 years, as we've more than doubled the numbers of vaccines that we give our young children, we've seen a doubling of learning disabilities, doubling of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, a doubling of asthma, a tripling of diabetes, and a 600% or more increase in autism in every state. The issue is what has happened over the last 25 to 30 years to cause this epidemic of autism. And so the only thing that really has changed is the number of vaccines being given to children.
My name is Dr. Janet Leviton, and I come to speak to you today as a clinician. I've been a pediatrician since 1982. When I was in my residency, I saw a baby die of a sudden infant death uh, just within hours after having been vaccinated. This is an event I saw take place uh, two more times in my early medical career. Since 1989, 40, there are records of 42 children from Massachusetts that have died around their vaccinations. 98% of them were trying to receive a school vaccinate, a school required vaccination. Nearly 90% died within the first 10 days, a third dying within the first 24 hours. This is Ryan, hours after his MMR, the last day that he was a neurotypical child. 15 months, we got his MMR. I remember him not sleeping that night, crying and waking up with a very toxic smelling diaper. I also remember 48 hours later, he had a 105 degree temperature, Three days after that, he had a full body rash. He started staring episodes, which we later realized were absence seizures. At 18 months, we discussed some of the changes, but his gross motor skills were still really good, so we gave him his 18-month shots. The next day, he stopped calling me mommy. He stopped wanting to be in the same room with his father, and he stopped following his sister around. <clears throat> By two, everything was gone. He was born full term, normal in every way vaginal birth with no interventions or drugs. His APGAR scores were 9 and 10, which means all his reflexes were perfect and present. Uh, before discharge, he was immunized with Recombivax HB against hepatitis B. His fourth night in this world was his first at home, and about five hours after arriving home, he had his first seizure. The doctors told us we were causing Ben seizures, odd behaviors, and delays by bad parenting. My son came out and he appeared to be normal at birth. Um, and then when they took him back to the nursery, he was um, given a, the hepatitis B shot, which contains mercury. And something happened to him in his blood where he became very ill and they put him in ICU. My son could yell or scream for 45 minutes straight and not stop. There was times um, he would crawl out of his car seat, I'd have to pull over on the side of the road, and he would be doing flips on my body, just screaming, just rages that you would not believe. I would have people stopping and writing my license number down. The language was lost, he drooled incessantly, he had um, extremely low muscle tone. Diarrhea was the, our first major red flag. Regressive autism is that your child does develop typically. And he does look like this true, big, perfect little thing. And then all of a sudden you wake up and they're gone. I'm crying my eyes out to the doctor saying, I know these things started this with my child. The vaccines caused this in my child. I can look at the videos and see the change in my child. I don't want her vaccinated. He said I had to. As more vaccinations came, more regression came. Um, after the MMR, within a month of that, she started to bang her head against the wall. Um, she started to just run right into the wall and it didn't seem as if she had any type of pain or feeling. Lindsay is representative of all the children who fall under the mandate. Lindsay received the hepatitis B vaccine two days before entering high school. The next day, she seemed flu-like. The day after that, so dizzy, she couldn't stand up without holding the walls. The following day, she passed out. Her ability to stand was compromised for almost six months due to unremitting dizziness. Following our doctor's advice, Lindsay had the series of three. It was on the third shot, Lindsay became so violently ill within two hours that I knew the vaccine was the catalyst of her illness. And my daughter received the vaccine about three weeks later, noticed a little bit of discomfort in her arm. Gradually over the next few weeks, it got worse and worse. At that point, she was anemic. To be put in the hospital, had a bone marrow biopsy. There was concern that she had leukemia, had a muscle biopsy because of the affected area of her arm. The following summer, she had meningitis as a consequence of her illness. She had um, a neurologic problem. Um, which was recognized to be part of this illness that required another spinal tap and MRIs and more medication. And it was all localized at the beginning in the arm where she had the Gardasil vaccine. You know, it, it would take a lot for somebody to come up to me uh, you know, as, a, as a professional and say, you know, I think your daughter is making these symptoms up. She had objective evidence, you know, abnormal spinal taps, 
clinical events, blood tests that were abnormal. Nobody could look at that and say, this is something you know, your daughter's making up. This is a coincidence. You know, your daughter has some bizarre illness which doesn't have a name, which we never heard of and can't identify or quantify in any way. But you know, we know that it's not related to the vaccine. Several have come out and say, well, yes, of course, this is obviously related to something in the vaccine. I couldn't believe that they would put children's lives at risk. And now I feel like I was taken advantage of and that I was naive. And um, as was Chris, her life was taken from a vaccine she didn't need about which we were falsely informed for a disease she never would have gotten. Within hours I saw what happened to my son. I believed it was a coincidence because I was told it was a coincidence. Because that's what I was told. I was told doctors are okay. They wouldn't do it. Even though the back of my mind, I saw what happened. I did it again for Christ's sake. I did it again. I listened. I was a responsible citizen again. And look what happened to my other son. They are allowing all of our children to have all of these symptoms, to have all of this pain. And because we as parents mentioned the word vaccine, just that one word, those children are absolutely left. Nobody gives a damn for them. They, how can doctors allow children to suffer? When babies are born, they are by definition born immature. Their neurological system is immature, their immune system is immature. What we do to these newborns is within minutes of birth. They're exposed to latex, they're exposed to uh, vitamin K shots. Within a few more hours after birth, then we give them a hepatitis B vaccine. The first paper that came out about the hepatitis B vaccine and using that vaccine in America was based off of a study that was done in Southeast Asia. And mothers there have incidents of high incidence of hepatitis B. We should probably give the hepatitis B vaccine to children in this country. It made no sense to me then. It probably makes no sense now. So a mere eight weeks old, eight weeks old, 56 days of life on this planet, the baby goes in for its first well baby checkup. And at that time, they may be given up to six or seven different vaccines, a DPT, which is diphtheria tetanus pertussis, a polio vaccine, another hepatitis B vaccine, a Hib, which is for Haemophilus influenza B, and possibly a Prevnar vaccine, which is seven strains of strep, maybe even 13 strains of strep, all given at the same time. So it's like giving 20 or 30 vaccine antigens in about five or six shots. That process is repeated at two months, four months, six months. They get another big dose of vaccines at one year of age. So that by the time children are one year old, they will have had more than 70 different vaccine antigens injected in measurable amounts of chemicals. In fact, the two vaccines that have the highest amount of chemicals, in my opinion, are the MMR and the chickenpox vaccine. When I hear statements such as Paul Offit saying that uh, a baby can receive up to 10,000, 100,000 vaccines at one go, it's difficult to even describe. The, the emotions that come up for me, I think, are rage, that this man has the kind of platform he does and has the kind of media attention. I mean, he's the main media mouthpiece uh, for the medical establishment speaking about vaccines. He and his attitude are an absolutely catastrophic danger 
to infant and young child health. The notion that, that, uh, that vaccines cause autism has been a harmful one. Harmful because I think it's unnecessarily scared parents about vaccines. Harmful because I think it's subjected children to, to therapies which can be dangerous. And harmful because I think most importantly it's really diverted a lot of resources away from, from far more promising leads as, as to the real cause or causes of autism. We know that autism, for example, is skyrocketing and it's not anymore a question or a debate that oh we're just diagnosing the condition better there is a true increase in the rates of autism and people are looking for answers now some have suggested that autism is a result of um, some gene mutations um, the problem with that is that gene mutations occur slowly and they cannot account for this huge increase in autism rates that we see in the developed world. I, I think that certainly autism spectrum disorder is at least genetic. I mean, when you have one identical twin with autism, the chance that a second identical twin will have autism is greater than 90%. When it's a fraternal twin with autism, the chance that a second fraternal twin has autism is less than 10%. So it's genetic and now some of the genes are being defined. We now know that immune molecules play crucial roles in brain development. This means that you cannot manipulate the immune system and think that that will not have adverse outcome, especially if you manipulate the immune system in early development. Some people have pointed that vaccines could be the problem, but they're often ridiculed for such um, assertions. But there is actually a scientific rationale for that, not just a scientific rationale, but there's also scientific data. By the time children, the average child in this country has started kindergarten, they've gotten 49 doses to 14 different uh, vaccines. Over 50% of our children now have some kind of chronic illness, over 50%. I would ask those who say that children can receive 10,000 immunization for um, very safely, I would simply ask them, well, can you demonstrate that by injecting yourself with 10,000 vaccines and then we can, you can give us your brain for analysis and see what we find after. Is it any wonder that we've got children that now need antidepressants and antipsychotics and Ritalin because they have inflamed brains from all these vaccines that have happened through their developmental years of life? And so if you begin to give children vaccines, you actually set their immune system toward one part of the immune system called the humoral part, which makes more antibodies. Yet, at the same time, you're suppressing their cellular immunity, which never develops completely. We are seeing an autoimmune reaction against the, the, the brain tissue. And so these children, unfortunately, even the ones who are not developing the syndrome of autism, are developing other syndromes, such as ADD and ADHD. And of course, the secondary problem is the number of allergies that we're seeing in, in our young children. And part of the allergic reaction has to do with the fact that the immune system is not completely developed at birth. It takes about three years for the immune system to be developed. You might go in one day and get the MMR and the DPT and an oral rotavirus, and you might get the meningococcal or you might get the flu vaccine the same day. I mean, there's any number of vaccines they can give you all at once. So I, I think the, what we're up to in an individual vaccine is now maybe 13 different vaccine doses in the one vaccine. It's that they're all given together. They might use the left arm, right arm, left leg, right leg, and the buttocks. So they might receive an unlimited amount of number of vaccines. Apparently the common cold is much greater insult to your immune system than, than a vaccine or even multiple vaccines. That's exactly right. I think a simple cold or, or even just a single ear infection is a far greater challenge to a child's immune system than, than would be the 14 vaccines that are typically given in the first few years of life. There are no safety studies showing that the combined uh, doses are safe for babies to take at that very young age. Where is the evidence for the claim that vaccines, whether singly or in combination, as children get them very often, are in fact safe and effective? There is no definitive 
answer to that. When I first started researching vaccination and looking at the whole concept of vaccine efficacy, because what always comes out is that vaccines are safe and effective, it took me a while to figure out what that word effective really even meant. We as clinicians and doctors and even parents in the lay public, when they hear the word effective, they assume that what that means when the phrase is said, vaccines are safe and effective, meaning that vaccines are safe and they will keep you from getting sick. To determine whether or not a vaccine is effective, you would ba basically have to do exposure experiments to people or to, the, or to animals if you were going to show that it was effective or not. You'd have to give the vaccine and then you would have to see if, if you exposed the animal to the pathogen that you would be would you be causing disease or not and would there be a difference in the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated population well it's considered unethical to do that with human beings to do to expose them to you know anthrax or a polio virus or a flu virus so um, in general the way vaccines are determined to be effective are if there's an antibody titer generated and if that antibody is generated it's considered to be effective Do the antibodies really mean that you are chronically sick? Does it mean you've had an exposure? You've had a, a certain level of protective antibody and you can still get sick? So the whole word in the scientific literature about effective vaccines means that you create an antibody, but that doesn't necessarily translate from effective into protecting you from getting sick. And oftentimes there isn't even that antibody generated in many of the people who are injected with vaccines. Um, elderly people, immunocompromised people often won't even generate that antibody so it's often a complete waste in them so that's how effectiveness is is determined um, by the companies when generating when developing new vaccines there is this prevalent belief in the medical community that if you vaccinate 90 percent of or 95 percent of individual of individuals you will effectively prevent the spread of um, infectious diseases and uh, the term uh, that is used is herd immunity. So basically, um, you immunize uh, almost the entire population, you will uh, eliminate the spread of an infectious agent. Now, that theory sounds really good, but it's only a theory. It hasn't actually been demonstrated. And if you look at the real world data, you see that um, their outbreaks frequently occur even if there is 90% of population that has been vaccinated. So this whole uh, concept of herd immunity is, uh, sim simply doesn't hold water because if it were true, you should not see any cases of infectious diseases outbreaks in populations that have been vaccinated. There are problems that come up with uh, prolonged mass vaccination campaigns. And um, one of them is that um, between the time that the vaccine is introduced on a massive scale and a few decades later, the disease actually becomes more dangerous. Are they efficacious? Do they actually protect against the diseases that they're meant to protect against? And I come back, for example, to the mumps vaccine. The mumps vaccine was introduced for commercial reasons, not for the benefit of children. It was the opinion of the CDC and others in the UK that this is a trivial disease in children, it was not needed. Now here's the problem. If you use a vaccine that does not work properly, is not efficacious, then you are storing up major problems. Why? Because for example, mumps is a trivial disease in children, but is not trivial in particularly young post-adolescent males it's where it can cause testicular inflammation and it can cause uh, sterility. Testicular inflammation or chitis is also associated with later malignancy in the testicle. If the vaccine does not work, if it only protects you for say one, two, three, four, five years, then by the time you are a teenager, you are no longer immune and that is exactly what's happened. There have now been outbreaks of mumps, multiple outbreaks in children who've received multiple doses of the MMR vaccine. So what mumps vaccination has done, because the vaccine is not efficacious, has taken a trivial disease and turned it into a much more serious disease.
over time, when you have an antibody, it goes away. And that's why even those who believe in vaccines know that the antibodies wane and why they are promoting now many, many, many booster shots. And now we are creating vaccines for diseases which we perceive as very mild, such as chickenpox or rotaviral stomach flu, and who knows what else is coming. And uh, for the sake of eradication of the virus, what, what is um, likely to happen 30 years from now is that these viruses will become much more deadlier for um, infants that are going to be born at that time and who will not have the luxury, now it's gonna be a luxury of maternal immunoprotection. Anaphylaxis now is almost every day. Schools are uh, urged to stockpile EpiPens because there are so many uh, kids with uh, different kind of food allergies or, or other uh, allergies that they are in danger for anaphylactic shock. The kind of anaphylaxis that we see today and, and can only be stopped by uh, epinephrine or other substances can only happen after the injection of these substances, foreign substances into the body, and it's basically the body's way of responding to, to these substances. We know that we're priming the immune system. We know that there's things going in these vaccines that when you put an adjuvant, a, 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 subject, a substance, an adjuvant is a substance that you intentionally put in a vaccine to create an immune response, which in many people will be an autoimmune response because you can get the viral particles adhering to vessel walls, cell walls, going into the brain from the heavy metals. So we're seeing asthma, we're seeing food allergies. I mean, when I was a kid, and I keep going back to when I was a kid, because it was a long time ago and we didn't get that many vaccines, somebody who had a food allergy was like one in, like I heard of one person. You know, there was one person in my school who had asthma, one person in my grade school. I went to a big grade school who had asthma. I mean, kids didn't leave to use their inhalers. It was just unheard of. What we face unambiguously is an epidemic of autism, an environmentally driven epidemic of autism, now alarmingly affecting one in 31 boys in the United States of America. And I saw data from Yale just the other day from South Korea showing that one in 36 children in South Korea are affected by this lifelong severe neurodevelopmental disorder. There is the true epidemic. A big chunk of the immune system that's missing here when we, when we talk about vaccines is the innate immune system. The innate immune system does not work with antibodies. It works with uh, mostly something called natural killer cells and are often vitamin D dependent, and there's other issues that guide them and control them. But innate immunity is your first line of immune defense. It's the most important line of immune defense. We know that people with antibodies to, to diseases will still succumb to those diseases. We know that when you have a community-acquired infection, such as measles or mumps, it engages both sides of the immune system, the side that's called Th2, which creates the antibodies, the Th1 side of the equation, which engages the self-immunity that is defined by the difference between knowing who you are and where your environment stops. The innate immunity is not addressed, mostly because if we did things that boosted our innate immunity, it's probably not patentable, it would probably be one thing if it was, and so it's being ignored. But we don't have the studies showing that because you have an antibody to a specific communicable disease, you are therefore immune. Those don't exist. The way it's done with an injection actually sets the immune system up in a way that can lead to autoimmunity. And so that's one of the major differences between a natural infection and recovery afterwards, which is lifelong and normal and an injection which uh, will maybe produce an antibody that will be temporary and won't necessarily be effective and could possibly be damaging. Real infection and you have fever and you have cytokines and you have white blood cells and you have all of these different types of uh, portions of your immune system coming together in a dance. And that's where lifetime true immunity comes from. When you are re-exposed to a virus or re-exposed to that infection, your immune system has been fully engaged and recognizes that and says, I don't have to process that again. We've done that once. They push out a little bit of intrinsic uh, immune system um, help to push that virus out of the way, and that's where true immunity comes from. To give a combination vaccine 
and then to load in, for example, other vaccines containing mercury preservatives and aluminum, which are going to alter the immune response even more profoundly, then no, we certainly do not, nor could anyone claim to know that those vaccines are safe. They are not, and there is a fundamental rule that something is unsafe until proven otherwise. You know, the rationale, the reasoning for how some of these drug companies and how the FDA concludes that something is safe or not safe is not based in rational science. It's based in, a, you know, a pre-biased uh, setup, really. We want, this, we want to be able to use this, this substance. It's cheap. It's a cheap way of preserving it, or it's a cheap way of reaching the blood-brain barrier to produce a larger immune response. We want to be able to use this product. Let's look for a study or do a study that we can say we've done it. What gets done is a bogus study or no study, but in some cases I was sent when I requested information from one of the drug companies, a study in one of the ingredients, and it literally was a cosmetic study for topical application, but yet it was something that was being injected. Vaccines contain formaldehyde and they contain chemicals far in excess concentrations of what the EPA says is safe. Mercury in the past was used as a preservative. Um, the reason it works as a preservative is because it's so cellular toxic. Because if you put mercury in a culture of cells, they will just die. Things don't live in the, in the presence of mercury. We're now telling our senior citizens to take flu vaccine. And guess what's in flu vaccine? Mercury. Mercury, every year, a senior citizen gets their flu jab. Every year, a bit more toxin is accumulating in their brain. And what are we now getting? An epidemic of dementia. This is our granddads and our grandmothers. These are the people we're now poisoning with our vaccines. This footage from the University of Calgary demonstrates the degenerative effects of mercury on brain neurons. Very low concentrations of mercury were added to the culture medium for 20 minutes. Over the next 30 minutes, the neurite membrane underwent rapid degeneration, leaving behind the denuded neurofibril seen here. These findings reveal important visual evidence to how mercury causes neurodegeneration. And I'm convinced that the mercury in vaccinations is a contributing factor to neurological diseases such as autism and Alzheimer's. I'm convinced of it after all those years we had hearings. But that word conclusive, there's no conclusive evidence, creates a doubt. And my question to the presidents and CEOs of pharmaceutical companies has always been, if there's any doubt, if there's any doubt that the mercury in vaccinations can cause a neurological problem, then get it out. It's not just the mercury. Yes, the mercury is a problem, but it's not just the mercury. And the pharmaceutical industry has pretty much proven that by taking most of the mercury out. Yes, it is still in the flu shots, the multi-dose flu shots. It was in the H1N1 swine flu vaccine. We still have traces of it in other vaccines, but for the most part, the lion's share of the mercury is out and we're still having an increased incidence of autism and chronic disease. So that was pretty easy for the pharmaceutical industry to just go, see, told you, one the mercury. Because it never was just the mercury. It's all the aluminum, it's polysorbate 80, it's a long list of 62 different types of chemicals that are in these vaccines and different combinations of them. It's the latex exposure, it's the gelatin exposure, it's a, the whole combination of the number of vaccines that children get now. It never was just about the mercury. The aluminum is used um, to do a different job. The aluminum is used to um, basically cause an intense inflammatory reaction at the injection site so that perhaps less disease matter is needed in the vaccine. Aluminum is a known neurotoxin and it is often claimed by the regulatory authorities that the amounts of aluminum is in vaccines is insignificant and that you get more aluminum from food than you get from injection. Well, this kind of reasoning really uh, defies basic toxicological principles. These claims are misleading because we know from research data that only 0.25% of aluminum that we ingest is absorbed into circulation, whereas the aluminum we inject via vaccination is absorbed with 100% the medical authorities will also say that 
uh, you can easily excrete aluminum in vaccines, but uh, that claim makes no sense whatsoever because aluminum would be a very lousy adjuvant if it was excreted. The whole premise of an adjuvant is that it stays in your body and it boosts the immune response. And we have now data, human data, that shows that humans retain aluminum from vaccinations up to eight years following injections. Aluminum in vaccines in a, is attached to an antigen, so it doesn't get readily excreted because it simply doesn't pass through the kidneys. And in fact, research in animal models shows that it's retained. And not only is it retained in the body, but it, uh, part of the adjuvant aluminum is transported by the macrophages in the brain of animals and in once in the brain it triggers abnormal autoimmune inflammatory reactions. Aluminum when combined with fluoride forms a very stable complex, aluminum tetrafluoride and aluminum tetrafluoride is a very good phosphate mimic so it basically binds to uh, receptors or it binds to uh, ATP or GTP where normally a reaction would happen uh, aluminum fluoride can actually uh, inhibit these reactions. We know that there's a host of children born with smaller or greater propensity of mitochondrial damage that their mitochondria might be sensitive but left to their own devices they would be okay okay so I'm not blaming the children for having these mitochondrial um, genetic you know vulnerabilities which is what I'm gonna call them but under the influence of all the oxidative damage intracellularly and in, 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 in the mitochondria, the, the mitochondria change and the ATP production changes and the child can become autistic. I recently learned that, you know, my child's uh, immune system should never have had any type of live viruses, you know, any vaccines to begin with, but live viruses especially. I believe that the MMR was, was the tipping point for my child. She had a handful of vaccines at that one time, and um, the MMR is a live virus. I watched um, a clip on YouTube, and it was Fran Drescher interviewing Kathleen Sebelius, and Fran Drescher specifically asked her. Now there's like 18, I think, and I was just wondering whether you um, had any thoughts on it or whether you think that there is any kind of uh, awareness raising to in the medical community. We should spread them out, not give them all together, not do them so young. And Kathleen Sebelius said emphatically, oh, we've done numerous of these studies. We have them, the NIH has done this. Clinical trials, testing not only safety of individual vaccines, but safety of vaccines given together the kind of spacing components, how frequently they have to be given. And we don't have these studies. And the only study that I could find that came close was a, a primate study where they, and I believe it was macaques, that they used macaques and they adjusted the dose for the weight appropriate for the macaque. And these monkeys did not do well, in fact, that they showed signs of, of uh, regression and autism and behavior changes and developmental delay and abnormal behaviors and poor rooting and poor sucking in the infant ones. So in fact, the only study that I've read about that I've seen when I've done my search has been on monkeys, has been on primates, and it was not favorable towards our schedule. To make a vaccine is essentially a manipulation of nature that can only possibly end in disaster because what you have to do is you have to go out and find a pathogen, bring it into the lab, and then you have to multiply that pathogen and adjust it to be in the form that you want it to be in to ultimately be injected into an infant or a toddler or an adult. I found there have been meetings between the scientists of the UK and the United States, the vaccine safety scientists the ones that are responsible for the health of our children. I found descriptions of how they made the vaccines. The measles virus, just at the same as the mumps virus, same as the other fever virus, is grown on the embryos of birds. We basically get fertilized eggs, wait till there's an embryo, kill the embryos, mash them up, and put them in what they call an incubator. They then wait two or three days and they, pre they add some previous culture, similar culture to it. And then they pipe off the fluid from underneath the cell culture. 
to be made into the vaccine. They filter out everything bigger than a virus. They filter out bacteria. They can't filter out viruses because they want measles virus, mumps virus in the vaccine. Could be in there. They could be onco oncogenes. They say this. We don't know if they're there. There's all sorts of cellular debris from the dead birds in the vaccines. Do we filter this out? No, we don't. Have we purified the measles virus? No, all the live virus vaccines are minimally purified. The chairman of the meeting said, well, have we tested it for the amount of free DNA from birds? And they said, no, we haven't tested it. We have got no way of testing it. This is before they add aluminum and it's before they add mercury or any other adjuvants. This is what all facts they call it the substrate. And one scientist from Britain said, if the Greens in my country heard about what, what we are discussing, they are demand immediately the ending of all vaccination. In mediums, and the mediums are either egg or their bovine serum. The problem with bovine serum is you, you can only test for what you know to test for, right? So there might be a lot of things piggybacking, but you can't always test for prions. And bovine serum can contain prions. And if you go into the journals for people in the industry, they'll say, purify bovine serum, lesser chance of prion. So lesser chance, you know, they can't even guarantee it's prion free. And then you've got egg medium. And the problem with that is that some eggs are infected with Campylobacter bacteria. Campylobacter infection is the number one cause, other than vaccines, of Guillain-Barre. So most people who come down with Guillain-Barre who hadn't had a vaccine, it's because they had a Campylobacter infection and because the antibodies that you make to Campylobacter can look like antibodies to your myelin sheath in your neurological system. So you create anti-ganglioside antibodies and then you, your myelin goes and they look like Guillain-Barre or polio, but this is what we see. Manufacturers are actually required to screen uh, chicken eggs for a number of contaminants and we know that uh, Campylobacter jejuni uh, is a potential uh, contaminant in vaccines and this same bacteria has been associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. It can uh, actually lead to, to death. It can start with muscle weakness and then uh, people can lose uh, their ability to walk and can go into a full paralysis where they basically are unable to breathe. It's estimated that a third of the population contains one very potent cancer virus that came in through the polio vaccines, the SV40 virus. That's just one shining example of, of one that was inadvertently picked up many years ago. And it took 30 years for the, for, the, um, for the medical community to embrace this fact and speak of it in the literature. And so it's mainstream literature you can find that this SV40 virus, which came through the polio vaccines, is indeed in, in many people and does cause tumors, causes brain tumors, mesotheliomas, or I should say is heavily associated in, in many cases um, to have this virus in the tumor while the surrounding tissue is free of virus. Children's brain tumors, um, 40 to 60 percent of them contain the SV40 virus. Five years ago, while his team was examining slides from children who died of extremely rare brain tumors, they discovered something shocking. Traces of an almost 40-year-old mystery, a virus known as SV40. It was believed that SV40 only infected monkeys um, and shouldn't be found in humans in any circumstance, let alone associated with tumors. What was your reaction when you found it? Uh, I almost fell out of my chair. Rhesus monkeys tens of thousands of them. The vaccine was made by removing the monkey's kidneys, injecting them with the polio virus, and then making a serum that gave humans resistance to polio. Only monkeys could be used, but they could carry lethal diseases. Dr. Howard Ernevitz of California is a microbiologist who specializes in investigating vaccines and how they're made. The best estimate we can get right now is that there was at least, at least 26 different monkey viruses in those preparations. Tell me uh, how you found SV40 in the polio vaccine. I came to Merck and uh, I was going to develop vaccines. And we had wild viruses in those days. You 
known in the wild monkey kidney viruses and so forth. And if I can't do something about it, quit. I'm going to try it. So I went down to see Bill Mann at the zoo in Washington, D.C. And he said, very simple. Get your monkeys out of West Africa and get the African green. So I brought African greens and I didn't know we were importing AIDS virus at the time. Got that damn that vacuolating agent that we have. I'm going to just pick that particular one. Mm -hmm. That virus has got to be in, in vaccines. And uh, it's got to be in Sabin's vaccine, so I quickly tested it. <laughs> sure enough, it was in there. I told Albert, I said, listen, Albert, I said, you know, you and I are good friends. But I'm going to talk about a virus that's in your vaccine now. The yellow fever vaccine had leukemia yeah. virus in it. I said, well, why are you concerned about it? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I have a feeling in my bones that this virus is different. I, I don't know why to tell you this, but I've been around biology a long time. I just think this virus may have some long-term effects. Mm -hmm. And he said, what? I was flown by British television to Washington because there was an emergency meeting taking place there that a monkey virus was being found in human cancers and it, they thought it probably came from a vaccine. Dr. Phil Miner is the most foremost British vaccine expert working for the British government. He was in Washington at this meeting. He addressed the meeting to say, we have to admit that the vaccines are made on very crude material. He also said that we, the public got to know how monkey virus 40, simian virus 40, got into the polio vaccine. But of course, we have managed to keep from them many other similar incidences. They don't know about these. People in the gathering obviously did know throughout human evolution has never seen these infections before and you limit the safety studies to three, four, five weeks uh, when these are known to be viruses that are capable of hanging around in the body and causing delayed disease. I spoke with Dr. Morris Hillerman at Merck who invented you know, the MMR vaccine and I asked him about the early days of his research. I said I understood that it was an attenuated virus, that the virus that he had weakened so it wouldn't cause measles, weakened sufficiently so it won't cause nasty side effects, but leaving it strong enough so that it would um, give, a, give us protection from measles. And he said exactly, you've hit the nail on the head. It's very difficult to work out this because we have to experiment with children. So I asked him, did he have any guidelines to do for his experiment? And his answer was very simple and very short. He said, yes, 20%. Well, I, I didn't understand the answer, 20%. So I asked him, 20% of what? And he said, oh, we judge it's okay if only 20% of the children fall ill after vaccination. I'm quoting him. The MMR vaccine, I felt was very safe. They had said it was very safe. I took him along to the surgery and within hours he started to become very fidgety and he started screaming and the pain was dreadful with him. Then my husband came home from work and he said you need to phone the doctor's surgery. So I did and I said to her, there's something wrong with my baby, there's something not right here, he's, got this, he's in pain. She said, pull yourself together, Mrs. Thomas. Some babies do that. Next morning, Michael was suddenly very quiet and then up went his fever again and he came out in a burns rash all over his body. I took him into the doctor's surgery and I mentioned the MMR and he said, oh, it's just a viral infection, Mrs. Thomas. He was not the Michael I knew. He would be very aggressive. I lost my friends within a week. All they could see was this child hitting their children. I think that what I know now is that the problems with vaccines in general and the MMR vaccine specifically are far greater than I had previously anticipated. I have four children. The first two children received the MMR vaccine. I, like so many parents, went along with the uh, requirements uh, and the recommendations for vaccination. I didn't, even as a physician and a scientist, I didn't question 
that which I should have done. And when I started to question it uh, around 19, 1991, the further I looked into it, the more concerned I became. And when I presented questions to those in authority, I found that the answers were completely unsatisfactory. Non-scientific, invested largely in a belief system, a hope, a wish, rather than hard scientific facts. And the more I've learned, um, the more concerned I have become, not only that the safety studies have not been done, but in some instances, as with, for example, the mumps vaccine, there was no need for this vaccination in the first place. Not my words, not my opinion, the opinion of the CDC and the regulators in the UK. So vaccines being introduced for commercial imperatives in the interests of the pharmaceutical companies rather than in the interests of the public. And that causes me huge concern. Was MMR introduced according to this senior CDC official? Someone there at the time on an, oh, to hell with it, called by the CDC. Did the CDC capitulate to what appeared to be a marketing ploy on the part of a pharmaceutical company? A ploy that allowed them to monopolize the US market? Is that the basis for 60,000 US adverse vaccine events reports, including 300 deaths at a bare minimum from MMR? Is that really what happened? Is that really what Mumps vaccine was all about? But if you're the one getting the, the product and you're the one going to suffer the consequences, do you want to put your life out there online so that Merck can make money when they really don't know? In a life and death debate, uh, should young girls be required to get a new vaccine to prevent cervical cancer? The maker of the vaccine is backing down, but at least one U.S. governor is not. Governor Rick Perry, a Republican, who made Texas the first state to mandate that sixth grade girls receive the HPV vaccine. In the midst of this executive order, there was a big drug company that made millions of dollars because of this mandate. The governor's former chief of staff was the chief lobbyist for this drug company. The drug company gave thousands of dollars in political donations to the governor. And this is just flat out wrong. Right. The, the question is, is it about life or was it about millions of dollars and potentially wow. billions for a drug company? All right. This um, is not a vaccine against a pandemic. It's not a vaccine against a childhood illness that will kill you. Um, it is a vaccine against a virus that 90% of the time does absolutely nothing to anybody. So we were recently approached by two mothers whose daughters have died um, approximately six months following uh, vaccinations with the HPV vaccines. Both girls uh, showed similar symptoms, uh, mainly affecting the nervous system, periods of amnesia, uh, difficulties in uh, speech, um, periods of confusion, psychosis. The symptoms started after the first shot. One girl died after the second dose of Gardasil and another girl died after the third dose of Gardasil. In both cases, the autopsy revealed absolutely no anatomical finding, no microbiological finding and no toxicological finding that could have explained why these girls died. And it was included simply that um, the case was unrelated to the vaccine. We, however, decided to look further into the issue um, and we uh, did a more comprehensive analysis on the brain samples that were provided to us by the coroner's office. Uh, we looked for various immunoinflammatory markers and we also looked for the presence of HPV 16L1 particles in the girls' brains. HPV 16 antibodies which recognize the particle that's in the vaccine have also 
uh, showed reactivity and they were binding to the walls of blood vessels in the brain. This means that the antibodies that is raised against the vaccine antigen is not only recognizing the vaccine antigen, it's also recognizing your own tissue. In the immune system is basically um, turning itself on and attacking the blood vessels in the brain, targeting them for destruction, which would explain why we found brain hemorrhages. In one of the cases, the autopsy revealed brain edema, which again, together with the hemorrhages, is suggestive of breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. And again, this points to an underlying vascular disorder in the brain which explains why these girls died suddenly and uh, way prior their time. One was 14 and the other one was 15. The only thing they had in common was Gardasil. I find it to be shameful what's going on with the treatment of some of these kids, as well as the denial of you know, the vaccine community that there may be an issue. Um, the very existence of the possibility of any type of illness related to vaccines is summarily denied by, you know, by uh, the pro-vaccine activists. And it, it simply is not you know, a reasonable, scientifically based dismissal. In schools right across Australia. From next year, boys aged 12 and 13 will receive the vaccination under the National Immunisation Program at a cost of $21 million over four years. It comes two years after the immunisation program began for girls. When Gardasil was approved, FDA deferred any studies in males under 18. And yet, uh, three years later, they approved the product for um, boys age nine and above. Now they want to immunize boys for the sake of herd immunity. You can acquire HPV infection through sexual contact. It's not something that's transmissible by air or water. What is the necessity of a nine-year-old boy getting this vaccine? particularly since it may only work three to five years, um, which hopefully is before they become sexually active. Antigenicity studies show that the antibodies last less than five years on average. While it covers a few strains, there's only one strain present at, um, at the five-year mark. We don't know how long that lasts. The other two or three strains are gone by two or three years in girls and less than that in boys. No one knows if there are going to be long-term sequelae from vaccinating these girls, if it's going to affect fertility, affect cancer rates, affect you know, other hormonal issues or their immune system in the long run, there's nothing to say that it will, there's nothing to say that it won't. Given that these vaccines have an unknown duration of lasting, it makes very little sense to me that we should be spending our precious healthcare dollars in, especially in the budget of the vaccine for children, that we should be spending it to mandate an HPV vaccine. So if, if the recommendation is boosters throughout the life, but if you've already been exposed and you receive the, vi the vaccine, it could potentiate the virus, then we're dealing with a vaccine that's probably going to be causing a whole lot more cervical cancers than it ever saves. Subjecting millions and millions of women to eliminate a few thousand cases of cancer doesn't really seem justified to me, even if it does eliminate those cancers. Even if it is effective, I wouldn't do it. Um, I've weighed the evidence and I would urge that other people do the same. To make sure that people understand the real way that we're going to prevent cervical cancer is to keep people in the pap smear screening programs. And then should they choose to get the vaccines, that's like choosing to buy a pair of red shoes. This is a vaccine that does prevent some HPV infections, specifically four kinds, two that cause warts and two that cause cancer. We don't know how long that will last. Um, and unless the vaccine lasts at least 15 years, there's no way we can prevent cervical cancer. Although it's been marketed in the popular press, in magazines, in you know, lovely advertising that shows happy girls with rainbows and dancing around as a cancer prevention. There simply isn't any data that it prevents cancer in women. 
Uh, and there's no reason that, that one should mandate it for your own child as a cancer preventative. Nardisil does not treat cervical cancer or other HPV diseases. Side effects include pain, swelling, itching and redness at the injection site, fever, nausea, dizziness, vomiting, and fainting. Gardasil is not for women who are pregnant. Gardasil may not fully protect everyone and does not prevent all kinds of cervical cancer. We didn't even know about dizziness and fatigue, um, let alone death or illness or paralysis or seizures or any of the other things that have been reported. Those of us whose daughters have experienced this want people to know. We want them to know what we didn't know. The question that is very often discussed and debated is whether vaccines contributed or not to the eradication of diseases. Many people, even if they talk about the dangers of vaccines, will mention, you know, they'll preface, oh, but, you know, vaccines have saved us from all these diseases that were killing us. And I actually believed that for a long time. And I didn't start to question that until I started, you know, looking at some of these graphs. In the 1900s, people died of scurvy, people died of tuberculosis, people died of yellow fever in this country, they died of scarlet fever. We never vaccinated away tuberculosis, yellow fever, scarlet fever. I use those as examples. People aren't dying of them in this country, right? And we didn't vaccinate against, away against it. They say that the introduction of vaccines actually reduced the amount of infectious diseases. But if you go back to the beginning of the century, you will really see that the thing that was reducing infectious diseases was an improvement in diet, an improvement in sanitation, an improvement in education, the environmental things that were improving as a result of improving economies. The uh, number of infectious diseases were going down. Many of the infectious diseases were already 90% reduced when the vaccines were introduced. Edward Jenner, born in 1749 in England, was a country apothecary barber surgeon. He's revered as being the father of vaccination. Jenner formulated the idea of vaccination after a rumor he heard amongst the dairy maids that those who got cowpox were protected from smallpox. In order to test the theory on May 14, 1796, he removed some fluid from a dairy maid named Sarah and then injected into the arm of James Phipps, a healthy eight-year-old boy. Phipps contracted cowpox and six weeks later, Jenner injected him with smallpox in which he took the fluid from an actual pox. When James did not come down with smallpox, Jenner concluded the cowpox protects the human constitution from the infection of smallpox. This indeed is the entire basis upon which the entire field of vaccination rests. Populations who were highly vaccinated against smallpox with the cowpox vaccine developed uh, terrible epidemics at times when they were between 95 and 100 percent vaccinated. Um, this was occurring in a town in England called Leicester and 95 percent of the people in that town were vaccinated. So the leaders of that town uh, decided to take matters into their own hands and they stopped vaccinating. They cleaned up their dairies, they cleaned up their streets, they gave plumbing to people, they focused on nutrition. And within several years, their smallpox um, outbreaks had gone down by 80 percent. When smallpox was on its way out in the United States during the second half of the 20th century, the vaccine was still universally mandated. But a few uh, public health officials and doctors discovered that in fact the, the smallpox vaccine had considerable risks and hazards and adverse consequences that people had not picked up on before and in their eyes had become more dangerous than the disease itself, which was, had pretty much died out in the United States after 1949. These people initially were written off and seen themselves as dangerous because they were destabilizing the value of the smallpox vaccine. Within a few years, however, those independent-minded scientists had become the ones who were expressing the common wisdom and smallpox vaccine was pretty much phased out uh, across the mass of the population. Look at death rates from all communicable diseases and, and scurvy because they're overlaid 
you could see that the death rates were declining from 1900. They reached their bottom in 19, early 1970. And in fact, after 1976 to 1986, it was pretty stable. But after 1986, death rates, especially pediatric death rates, but death rates in general from infectious diseases began to climb again. And even if you take HIV out of the equation, there are more people now dying from infectious diseases than there were in 1970. Here are the actual government statistics from 1838 to when the vaccines were implemented in 1967. High back then, dropping, dropping, dropping. Guess what? We had better sanitation. We had cleaner water. We were pasteurizing milk. We had public health measures. And by the time the vaccines was introduced, it was 98% gone. Measles was not a severe or deadly disease at the time when the vaccination was introduced. And yet, um, 30 years later, in the 90s, what transpired is that the last measles epidemic was considered very bad. 24% uh, of all the measles cases started to happen in infants. The 80s and maybe 70s, we do have reports, uh, epidemiological reports of measles in fully vaccinated communities. There are academic papers that are termed the paradox of measles, meaning that you're more likely to contract measles in an outbreak if you have been vaccinated. In some of these outbreaks, not only were there the, every single child or teenager who contracted measles had been fully vaccinated, the few that weren't vaccinated did not come down with measles. And what was concluded? What was concluded was that the vaccinated were providing herd immunity for the unvaccinated. But think about that for one minute. That doesn't make any sense. If there was herd immunity from the vaccinated, why were they coming down with measles and the unvaccinated not? Recently, we have seen outbreaks of mumps and pertussis in the last couple of years. And in the mumps outbreak that happened in Iowa about two or three years ago, we found that 67% of the children who contracted mumps had at least one, many of them two, MMR vaccines, so they should have been protected from getting the mumps. In the pertussis outbreaks that were happening in California, we found that out that the vast majority of those children had had pertussis vaccination and had the full series. In my generation, we all had pertussis. We were a, a immune for about 20 years, and then we'd be exposed to it again, which is how we maintained our immunity. And now that we're playing with this and with this ecosystem, we're seeing antigenic shifts, and we're seeing it in pertussis, but we're seeing it in other, uh, other things as well. So those that are vaccinated get colonization of parapertussis in the throat. And so they're carriers of paraprotosis. So in fact, it's the vaccinated who are creating the problem, not the unvaccinated. It, the claim has been made that uh, in India uh, last year, in 2012, there were no wild type uh, cases of polio. Uh, but at the same time, there were about 45,000 cases of uh, paralysis which uh, is reclassified and it's uh, considered uh, AFP, which is most likely caused by the vaccine. Vaccine strains can revert to virulent. So for a long time, uh, the only polio cases in the United States were vaccine, were derived from vaccine strains. Um, and for that reason, we no longer use live polio vaccine in the US. We're only giving children killed vaccine, which cannot revert to virulence. So you can't get polio from the killed vaccines in the US now. But in the third world, um, because live vaccines are much cheaper to produce, um, live vaccines are still being used and uh, cases of polio related to vaccination are still occurring. We had you know, almost 50,000 cases of um, deaths or paralysis from the vaccine, all vaccine acquired polio. And there were on average about 12 cases of paralysis a year in that area, presumably from polio. So we went from 12 cases a year to 47,500 cases in a, in a two year span. And, um, but phew, you know, they're not actually dying or being injured from wild polio, it's just the vaccine induced polio. There were 
um, epidemics of paralysis that were occurring in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And they were predominantly occurring in children, but they were also occurring in adults. In fact, FDR, one of the most famous polio victims or alleged polio victims, was, I believe, 40 years old when he contracted his paralysis. There was this paralysis that certainly was occurring, and nobody wants to deny that, that there was paralysis occurring. Respiratory muscles were paralyzed, limbs were paralyzed, and in children, that essentially meant that that limb wouldn't grow normally and it would be small, like we see the pictures. This is, um, these para paralytic cases occurred in the summertime, as opposed to the majority of viral illnesses, which will occur in the wintertime. Polio virus itself was a normal flora, and in fact, 95% of the population would be exposed to polio and not even know it. So polio was a normal endemic virus found in water and you would get exposed as an, an infant, create antibodies, not become sick, and it was a very small percentage of, of people that would ever become sick. 95% of the people who were exposed to polio, even in those days, had, did not know they were exposed, they had no symptoms. 5% had some mild symptoms, and then a small percentage of that 5%, one to two, had paralytic polio. Some of the many reasons that people suffered from paralysis in the early 1900s was DDT, arsenic compounds. Arsenic um, was used in a, a newer Neo Salverson um, compound to treat many diseases, as was mercury, by the way. They're both neurotoxic. DDT is neurotoxic. But many other things can cause paralysis Coxsackie virus, echoviruses, transverse myelitis. The list goes on and on. And in fact, the, the requirement to make a diagnosis of polio prior to the vaccine was just. 24 hours of weakness or paralysis. Of course, the requirement changed. Once there was a vaccine, they wanted to show that paralysis and polio was reduced, and so the requirement became much more stringent. But prior to the commencement of the vaccination um, scheme, diagnosis of polio was made, and it could have been many, many other things, including all the things I mentioned, plus more. We know from historical documents that come either from history or from government bodies like the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, that have tracked these illnesses. And illnesses have spiked and been mostly gone by the time a vaccine was introduced, making the vaccine the hero when in fact the illness was mostly gone before the vaccine ever came on the horizon. For any procedure that can kill and injure, you must give people choice. The existing and emerging science linking vaccines to chronic illness and neurodevelopmental damage is devastating. Conflicts of interest have changed the rules of the game and no longer protect our children. Drug companies and doctors are protected from most liability related to vaccine injury and death. Now, vaccines, for the most part, children's vaccines, are mandatory. That's real extremism. One of our basic human rights is that we should have control of what goes uh, into our bodies, and mandates are uh, violating this basic human right. And the only way that vaccines work as they do right now is because they're mandated, right? Kids can't go to school unless they comply. The vast majority of hospitals around the country are implementing exemption policies for vaccines for their employees that violate federal law. And this really concerns me. They're overly aggressive in requiring vaccines and not allowing people to refuse vaccines, in many cases, who have a valid legal right to refuse the vaccines. Research community, the medical community, um, uh, saying, look, uh, what we need to provide uh, the public is uh, uh, good information. and Let them make the decision based on facts. We have the emergency community, the Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management Agency people talking about forced vaccinations, forced quarantines, uh, basically uh, the politicians uh, uh, running the show instead of the people who are the, from the medical community. I've talked with healthcare workers from all over the country and they report to me, they see the vaccine damage firsthand. They see their co-workers and in many cases the healthcare workers that call me themselves report vaccine injuries. And this is why we see more and more healthcare workers uh, objecting to mandatory vaccines in the workplace. There are new laws that have been passed which even uh, require a registry 
a registry of children who are not vaccinated, their parents. This is getting close to a kind of a Stalinist regime. If the current aggressive agenda for vaccines continues playing out, and this amounts to more and more people being required to get more and more vaccines with no end in sight, we are moving in the direction of what I can only call a vaccine police state. In a democracy where citizens are expected to be able to make choices for themselves, the government is instead telling people what to do, requiring people what to do. And that itself makes a lot of people unhappy especially when there are hazards involved. The pharmaceutical industry and the government promotes vaccines by telling the public these are safe and effective. That's what they say. Um, and yet, legally speaking, they're unavoidably unsafe. It's an established medical and legal fact that vaccines cause permanent disability and death. Officials from the FDA, CDC, and the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons have all said that something on the order of 90 to 99 percent of vaccine adverse events are never even reported. So we really have no idea, no hard data to tell us what the scope of vaccine injury and death is. Therefore, it's impossible to make a calculation about whether or not there's a net benefit from vaccines. So there's a real contradiction here at the core of vaccine policy and law. But if they're really as safe and effective as they tell us they are, then surely everyone will opt for them. Surely this a market would handle this. Going back three centuries, there have been a huge variety of conflicts over all kinds of vaccines where people have, been, uh, have rioted, people have fought in their legislatures, often successfully, to contest vaccines and their mandating. Mandatory why? Well, the story is that if 95% of the population isn't vaccinated, there won't be so-called herd immunity. You can't have 95% of the population immune if the children's vaccines only give you immunity for two to 10 years. That means that most adults, in fact, are not immune. Well, but it's a very potent weapon. It's a justification for mandating vaccines because if everyone who is vaccinated, but who may have a neighboring child who's not vaccinated, they might be at risk. This is the way the argument goes. But it does have power to persuade states to force vaccines on children. I'm hearing from uh, people around the country saying that pediatricians are just flat out refusing to treat any child who's not vaccinated, whether parents have a legal exemption or not. And in many cases, I believe this is actually violating parents' constitutional rights. Public health monies from the federal government can be dependent on state compliance rights. So for instance, in New York City public schools, we've found letters on the internet from the health department to principals that state, if your school doesn't have a compliance rate of 98%, i.e., you know, your vaccine compliance rate, you personally, the, the principal personally can be fined because the school district, the, the health department will get less money from the federal government. Well, Obamacare has uh, language that provides grants to states for promoting vaccines that includes things such as having people go door to door. Unless you think the American people are just incredibly stupid, which I suppose you could make a case for, but it's not a case that I find very compelling, that we can look back and see that the masses of citizens in this country have thought in a very wise way and in a very democratic way about the proper role of vaccines and vaccine mandates in American history. The federal government subsidizes vaccine research and development to the tune of billions of dollars each year. The federal government passed laws removing the vaccine manufacturers from liability from the death and disability caused by their products. State and federal governments mandate vaccines. State and federal governments purchase vaccines. And the federal government compensates those people who manage to successfully get through the vaccine injury compensation program. This is the biggest racket anywhere on the planet. I don't know of any other industry that has this kind of support from government.
The science, some of the science at the CDC may well have been fraudulent. Paul Thorson, who was one of the study authors in the 2003 study that's been informally referred to as the Danish study, was hired by the CDC to pull together research to show that vaccines don't cause autism. What steps has the CDC undertaken to ensure the integrity of the research that was uh, performed by Dr. Thorson? Uh, who, as you know, has been indicted for misconduct and misallocation of resources. Dr. Thorson, um, who was a co-investigator on a, a couple of studies that, were, that uh, came out on autism, um, was really just one investigator. And um, that body of evidence um, related to vaccines and autism... Right, have, have you gone back to validate uh, the variety of studies he participated in? I mean, you know this guy is a, a humongous scumbag, one of the most wanted men on earth and you relied upon him for data so this, to, divide, this, to determine whether thimerosal uh, had a negative effect. One of the witnesses told me that uh, the fugitive doctor had been involved in a couple studies uh, with CDC, and, and I have information here that he was involved in 21 of the 24 studies, and I would like to submit that to the record. In April of 2011, Paul Thorson was indicted on 13 counts of fraud and nine counts of money laundering with the CDC calling into question, as far as I'm concerned, all of his research supposedly showing that vaccines don't cause autism. As far as we can see, the U.S. government has done almost nothing to bring this man back to justice and to find out what's going on. Simpsonwood was the transcripts of a secret meeting that was held between CDC and representatives of the vaccine industry in which they reviewed a report that CDC had ordered, the Verstraten study, of the 100,000 children in the United States Vaccine Safety Database, which they are talking about the undeniability of the connection between autism and thimerosal, the impossibility of massaging the data further in order to try to eliminate those signals. That's what they spend the first two hours. The rest of the meeting they spend talking about how do we hide this from the press, from the public, and what they call the predatory bar. And if really these vaccines are so safe and effective as they're being sold as being, then why should they mind if there's no liability protection? Protection from liability is giving companies uh, no incentive to develop safer products. One solution would be repeal the 1986 law, right? If the law were repealed, people could sue manufacturers directly. Um, my guess is we'd see a lot safer vaccines. They are going to consider their bottom line uh, ahead of the safety. You can't have it both ways. They can't be unavoidably unsafe and safe and effective at the same time. Merck, GlaxoSmithKline, they have been forced to into settlements, multi-billion dollar settlements. And guess what? They're repeat offenders. Vaccine policy and law is being driven by the pharmaceutical industry. We need to understand what that means. This is an industry that routinely engages in criminal behavior. In 2012, Glaxo got a billion dollar criminal fine. In 2009, Pfizer got a billion dollar criminal fine. Criminal and civil fines in the hundreds of millions of dollars in the pharmaceutical industry are common. No one should ever be required to take a product from an industry that routinely engages in criminal behavior. The U.S. Department of Justice has sued them several times for criminal as well as civil uh, crimes. Now, these are the same manufacturers who have complete immunity when it comes to vaccine injury. So they have no incentive whatsoever to worry about safety because the government has given them a pass. There are laws in place already and bills for additional laws that would allow children to consent to vaccines. Here in North Carolina, we actually have a law that lets a child of any age consent to vaccines and other medical treatments. This is a blatant violation of the U.S. Constitution. Amend the statute, amend the 1986 law, and 
continue to allow the pharmaceutical industry to have liability protection for the seven vaccines that were covered when the law was passed. That's the MMR, DPT, polio. But not to cover the nine vaccines that have been federally recommended since the statute passed. The influenza vaccine, hepatitis B vaccine, hepatitis A vaccine, varicella vaccine, haemophilus B vaccine, a whole rafter of vaccines that very, very few countries in the developed world um, have gone along with the U.S. on. It is heart-wrenching when you receive an email from a mother who lost their child because, and she thinks it's the vaccination. She goes to 60 doctors asking if they would be willing to analyze the autopsy samples, if they would be willing to investigate further, to find answers, and they all say no. The death of your child could not be possibly due to the vaccine. You're asking the wrong question. How can they dismiss concern without even investigating? For the pharmaceutical industry, Moral, ethical, and even legal boundaries are merely financial considerations. No one goes to jail, there's a net profit, and so they keep engaging in the same criminal behavior. In 1986, Ronald Reagan signed into law the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Compensation Act, and what it provided for was a compensation program for children um, who were injured or died as a result of vaccination. So it was absolutely acknowledged that vaccines cause catastrophic injury and death. I don't like to call it a court because it's not a court. There's not normal rules of civil procedure. There's not a jury. You don't have justice being administered by your peers. It's a special master who's not a scientist, who's not a doctor, it's a lawyer. And that person listens to expert doctors and scientists about whether or not this is plausible, that this was caused by a vaccine. And in something like four out of five cases, uh, the petitioner doesn't get compensated. Government participates in the development of uh, vaccines through uh, public-private partnerships. And it also, at the end of the day, is liable for any kind of vaccine injuries. The result of this 1986 law is you cannot go to court and sue Merck or Sanofi or Glaxo for a defective vaccine or for injuries that you believe were side effects that, were, that you were improperly warned, say. Typical tort claims that you can bring against a manufacturer in other medicines, Vioxx, Celebrex. You can't do that for a vaccine. The government stepped into the shoes of the pharmaceutical industry because of this 1986 law. So this makes it very hard for the government to be uh, an independent and impartial body. And so this is, this is one, of the, one of the problems and uh, restoring liability where it belongs with the manufacturer should make uh, vaccines much uh, safer. Jonas Salk, the inventor of the inactivated polio vaccine, he made this argument to Congress in the hearings for the 1986 statute. He said, I'm very worried that this is going to take away the incentive for manufacturers to make vaccines safer. In my view, Gardasil would have never happened uh, prior to the 1986 uh, Vaccine Injury Compensation Act. So this program, um, although it's very difficult to win, over 3,200 families have prevailed in the, um, the injury compensation program, and the federal government has paid out $2.5 billion. person who's been permanently disabled with a serious neurologic condition um, in a child autism for example or in an adult you know a brain injury uh, the cost of care for that person could uh, reach seventy five or hundred thousand dollars a year or more so that gives you an idea of how serious these injuries are uh, that families families get awards from very small amounts of ten or twenty thousand dollars but up to millions of dollars for life care for life because some of these children who are injured um, are devastated. 
part of the issue, of course, being that nobody is responsible for these kids once they get injured. Then you find out that your son actually does have a vaccine injury and you have no recourse whatsoever. And it is honestly like pulling teeth, trying to get a doctor to, to even agree that your child may have been affected adversely by vaccines, whether or not you watched it happen. And if you don't like the decision that the DHHS employee made regarding your claim that you had a vaccine injury, um, it gets reviewed by another DHHS employee. And if you don't like that, you are barred from entering the court system. There, there is no way you can litigate your claim. It's really hard to prove a vaccine injury. I believe that had we been allowing families to go to regular courts with regular juries, with regular rules of discovery and civil procedure over the last 25 years, I believe we wouldn't be seeing the crisis of childhood health that we're seeing today. So I can't sue them because their creation of that vaccine did this to my kid. I'm financially responsible. They are not. It's just... This is supposed to be America. It's supposed to be free. We're supposed to have a liberal religious choice. We're supposed to be able to do what we feel is right within our own family. And with the government trying to tell us what to do, I mean, why, why call it a free country? Robert Mendelssohn was a pediatrician and a medical doctor. Uh, and he came out in the, in the mid-1970s in a very outspoken way about vaccines and about vaccine injuries. What he said was that, uh, you know, vaccines were a medical time bomb and that we were trading uh, the normal childhood illnesses that the majority of children they get, they get over just fine, they develop lifelong immunity. We're trading the benefit of that lifelong immunity from normal childhood illnesses for a lifelong suffering of chronic diseases. And that's where we've gone. We've been told time and time again by our state and local health officials, as well as the CDC, NIH, and the FDA, that vaccines are safe and effective. However, Studies and science shows otherwise. We should consider the benefits and the risks of vaccination. Unfortunately, uh, you know, our public health officials haven't got to that point and, and they keep repeating that the benefits of vaccinations outweigh the risk, but uh, we don't really have the studies uh, to prove that. 2008, a medical doctor from Harvard University, Dr. Marcia Angel, who spent 20 years as an editor for the New England Journal of Medicine, went public and said we can no longer trust the medical authorities and the medical literature. The pressure from money involved with what gets published and what doesn't get published has just skewed the medical publishing industry to the point to where the medical literature is no longer reliable. I've collected numerous studies, these are just a fraction of studies on lack of safety, lack of efficacy on vaccines. And these are mainstream published peer-reviewed papers. There's, this is just a small stack of them. I've got many more, uh, as do many of my colleagues. Why we are not being heard is for obvious reasons. We're out moneyed by the industry, by the lobbyists. The voices of independent scientists who raise issues about vaccine safety are often ignored or uh, we are personally attacked. Uh, and this is, this is not good for science and this is not good for scientific discourse. Why are the pharmaceutical companies sponsoring most of the research? Medical research should not be about money, it should be about better medical care and how to improve uh, the life quality of people, not how to make more money. You can't trust what you hear from the CDC now. You can't trust what you hear from the FDA because those workers have been bought off. They're waiting for their jobs in, in the uh, pharmaceutical industry. They're waiting for their jobs in the lobbying industry. In 2010, there were over 330 vaccines either already on the market or in development. In early 2013, there are 250 vaccines either already awaiting approval from the FDA or in clinical trials. There are hundreds of vaccines in the pipeline for a variety of conditions, including asthma and obesity and smoking, and the list goes on. 
We have to change the way Washington works or we'll never get transparency and we'll never get the truth. We'll, we'll continue to have studies that are set up to show a certain outcome, irregardless of what the realities are. Where the rubber meets the road on this issue is in legislation. We need to become legislatively active. We need to oppose bills that if passed would require more vaccines of more people and bills that if passed that would limit our right to make informed choices. The only thing we can do as a population is to demand transparency, demand liability uh, on the part of these manufacturers. And I think that we have to overturn Citizens United and we also have to change campaign financing. We need to support and promote the passage of bills that give us a right to make an informed choice. The only way to change this is to, to demand it from our the people who work for us, our legislators, and to change the way campaigns are financed. I don't know what the end game is here. The direction we're moving is a very disturbing direction where we're seeing more and more vaccines required and our rights to make informed choices being taken away. We don't have an intelligent media to at least demand answers of those in authority. Within my news department at WBZ, I began to present the scientific research that was current and recent and new to news management. I also began to present them stories of vaccine-damaged children that I had come across in my scientific investigations. What I was told time and time again is that there is no story, that the science is settled, that there is no reason to present stories of this nature on TV because simply these are fringe stories. This is not representing the masses. And to me, it was surprising because I thought the media was supposed to be a voice of the people. People, and clearly at that point in my newsroom, it was not acting as a voice of the people. The media in the UK do not want to know. They are followers of the government. They are put a D notice, though the media have been threatened. I've been told this. I mean, for God's sake, what, you know, media are there to show what's going on, to show life. It's not happening. It's such a cover up. It's unbelievable. You know, it's been said that a lie repeated often enough will become the truth. I like to think that the truth repeated often enough can do the same thing. We need to be able to give our parents enough information to make informed choices. And I think that we need to actually stop with the vaccines at this point. But it's a problem if the government is going to pass laws that are going to coerce and are going to have vaccine squads looking for children who haven't been vaccinated. Well, then we're in very, very big danger just say no, right? Until your kid has to go to daycare or until your kid has to go to school, there is no law. There is no law that's forcing you to vaccinate your child. I saw it, I felt it, I questioned it, but I didn't question loud enough. I allowed them to bully me and that's something I have to live with. 48 states out of 50, there are religious exemptions. If as a matter of religious sentiment and consciousness, you cannot vaccinate your child, you have the right to file a religious exemption. And people are now doing that in higher numbers than they used to. In 19 states, there are philosophical exemptions. People can say, no, I'm not gonna give the hepatitis B vaccine. I don't believe in that. I believe in polio, I don't believe in hepatitis B. And that's fine. I think every parent uh, has the right responsibility and should have the authority to make health choices about their about their children. We need to ask people to look at this. You know, it, this is a serious medical intervention. Is it justified? So I encourage the committee to uh, endorse this bill and the legislature to pass the bill that will allow people to decline on vaccines or delay vaccines, not only due to their religious beliefs, but because of their, perhaps their ethical beliefs, their moral beliefs, their lifestyle, their philosophy, their conscience. It's a fundamental human right to control your own health in that regard. 
Is this, does the science support this? Is there science to show this is safe for a day old infant? The federal recommendation is that day old infants get a vaccine against a sexually transmitted disease, hepatitis B. It is a vast and uncontrolled human experiment. So there are very serious questions and is it possible that there could be lawsuits for fraud and for malfeasance? For um, overreaching by state authorities, yes, I think there are possibilities and I'm very interested in pursuing them. I really implore everyone to wake up and read for yourselves, read for yourselves what the realities are about the vaccines, about the safety and the efficacy or the lack thereof. You, you really need to think twice and really need to learn the risks that truly are there and that are involved if you decide to vaccinate your child. Time is ticking and our, our next generations are becoming more and more injured. The rates of autism and chronic diseases are skyrocketing out of control in the next generation. Most of the epidemiology out there will not ever pick up the subset of children that will react to these vaccines. Each of the individuals that get vaccinated, they have responses each time they're vaccinated, and those are cumulative, but vaccine safety does not require cumulative testing, um, and even the testing for single vaccines is very limited. And all we are asking you to do as parents, as citizens, as representatives of injured children, is to allow parents to make a choice about medical procedures that are performed on their children in order that they may participate in the most fundamental uh, right of citizenship, which is the school system. We are now very powerful. All of us parents together in the UK, all of us parents in America, and in other countries, Australia, everywhere, we together are a powerful force and nobody, nobody on this earth will ever, ever harm our children and get away with it. I don't care who they are. I don't care how powerful they are. You have done the worst thing ever to a mother. You have harmed her child.